Okay, good afternoon. Um, it's one o'clock and I'd like to call to order the Green Mountain Care Board's October 12th, 2022 board meeting. Um, first, thank you all for being here. Uh, we see we have all the board members present and the executive director, um, Susan Barrett. Uh, my name is Owen Foster. I am the new chair of the Green Mountain Care Board. Uh, I started last week and this is my first board meeting, so it's nice to be here. Uh, also joining us is another new care board member, uh, Ms. Dr. David Merman. Mr. Merman, if you'd like, Dr. Merman, if you'd like to introduce yourself. Hi, uh, I'm Dave Merman. I'm a practicing emergency physician here in Vermont. Um, been practicing for about a decade um, in rural hospitals, academic hospitals, uh, city hospitals, uh, and I'm very excited to be part of the Green Mountain Care Board. Really excited to serve Vermonters and uh, and and uh, promote the mission of the board. So thank you so much. Thank you, Dave. Um, and before I turn to Susan, I wanted to thank on the record uh, the care board staff and the other board members for working so diligently the last week and a half and even before that in getting uh, David and I up to speed. Uh, we've been really impressed by the team and uh, they've done the best they can to get us as much information that we can digest as possible. So thank you to the staff and the board and Susan for all their work. Um, and with that, I'll turn it over to uh, the executive director, Susan, director Susan Barrett. Thank you, Chair Foster, and and welcome to both of you. We're we're really looking forward to working with with both of you and having a full board. It's it's very exciting. So I have a few announcements. Uh, first, some new uh, open public comments and then an ongoing public comment. Uh, first, the board received the One Care Vermont uh, certification on September 1st of this year and the FY23 budget from One Care Vermont on September 30th. One Care Vermont will present their budget at a public board meeting on Wednesday, November 9th, and the board staff will present their analysis on Wednesday, December 7th. Public comment can be submitted through Friday, December 2nd to be considered ahead of the Green Mountain Care Board staff presentation on December 7th, or by Friday, December 16th to be considered ahead of the Green Mountain Care Board vote, which will occur before the end of the year and is tentatively scheduled for Wednesday, December 21st. There's a lot of dates here, uh, a lot of information. It's all available on our website, but I'm, I'm just reading it off to you so folks are aware. The second public comment that we've opened is the board received Gather Healthcare, Health ACO's FY23 budget on September 30th, and Gather Health will present their budget at a public board meeting on Monday, October 24th, and the GMCB staff will present their analysis on Wednesday, November 2nd. Public comment can be submitted through Friday, October 28th for Gather to be considered ahead of the Green Mountain Care Board staff presentation on November 2nd, or by Friday, November 11th, to be considered ahead of the Green Mountain Care Board vote, which is tentatively scheduled for Wednesday, November 16th. And then the board has an ongoing public comment period for anyone who wants to comment on the next potential all payer model with the Center for Medicare and Medicaid in for innovation. Any comments that we have received or will receive, we share, we share with AHS and the governor's office as they are leading the negotiations on the potential next model. Uh, secondly, uh, we I, I'm going to announce a rate decision that the board uh, decided on September 30th, and that is the board issued its decision and order approving modifications to the 2023 Blue Cross Blue Shield AHP filing. The decision and order is posted on the Green Mountain Care Board's website, on the What's New page, and on the filing page on our rate review website. And I'll also mention again that all of our open public comment periods are listed on our website under public comment. And then I've been announcing this uh, for the last several meetings. Uh, I want to just remind anyone at the meeting today and anyone you may know who purchases their own insurance as an individual or a family 
that recently federal uh, a new federal law has extended and expanded subsidies that are available for those plans. So we encourage you or anyone you know to uh, check out our website under premium tax credits where you can look at the information and it will link you to a, another website um, on the exchange for Vermont where you can actually see if you qualify, even if you didn't previously qualify, we strongly encourage folks to check that out. And that is all of my announcements for today. I'll turn it back to you, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Ms. Barrett. Uh, the second agenda item today is the approval of the minutes from the board meeting of September 28th, 2022. Uh, Dr. Merman and I did not participate in those uh, in that board meeting. Um, however, we have three board members who were participants. Uh, is there uh, a motion to approve the minutes from September 28th, 2022? I'll move approval. I'll second. Uh, is there any board discussion relating to the minutes from September 28th, 2022? Hearing no discussion. Uh, those in favor of approval of the minutes of September 28th, 2022, please say aye. 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 That's three ayes and uh, two abstaining. It is a unanimous approval of the minutes from September 28th, 2022. Thank you. Um, Susan, I'll turn it back to you. Sure. So, um, I wanted to just say a few words about our next presentation, our first presentation actually for the day um, that Marissa Melamed will provide. Uh, this is the first in a series of presentations that I've asked the staff to put together. Um, as, as we saw, we have two brand new board members and board member Walsh is it's still in his first year. So for him, this is the, the first time he's going through ACO oversight regulation. So um, as we move through our calendar of events and regulatory activities, I've asked the staff to prepare some uh, educational materials for the board so that you can hear hear this as a board and discuss this uh, with each other and, and with your peers on the board. And um, I think it's a good way for everyone to be brought up to speed on our regulatory activities and uh, and really for the board to ask our staff questions on our work. So with that, I will turn it over. Well, I could turn it back to you, Chair Foster, or I can just turn it right over to Marissa for her presentation. Uh, please go ahead, Marissa. Great, thank you. Uh, welcome, Chair Foster and uh, Dr. Merman. Uh, if you'll allow me a moment to project my slides and then I'll get started. Uh, is that showing up all right? I'll take that as a yes. Good afternoon. Uh, my name is Marissa Melamed. My title is Associate Director of Health Systems Policy, but my functional role at the Green Mountain Care Board is to direct the board's ACO oversight program. I'm lucky enough to be the first staff member to present to the new board members uh, because I direct the regulatory process that happens to be the first one that you'll go through this fall. So, uh, in addition, um, Board member Tom Walsh did start um, after this process was completed last year. So three of five of our board members have not yet been through the ACL process. Uh, that being said, we thought you might appreciate some background and history on ACL oversight before we dive into the details of the submitted budget, um, which are, are posted if people wanna start uh, looking, looking through those, as Susan mentioned. Uh, I'll, I will endeavor to address some of your questions through these slides or at least facilitate your understanding of the process um, and the charge before you. This is a broad and complicated area of review. So 
just remember that this is just the first time that we're going to discuss this process. And we have the next several months to work through these concepts and your questions um, as the regulatory review runs from October uh, through December. Um, so our goals for today are as follows. Uh, one, uh, to give a brief background and history of ACOs and ACO regulation in Vermont. Um, that will include a, a very brief discussion um, of, a, of, of a complicated topic, which is what is an ACO um, and who are the major stakeholders. Um, also, a, a brief history of, of the ACO concept um, and ACO regulation in Vermont specifically. Um, Vermont, the Vermont ACO market and regulation is unique to Vermont. So there are statements that I'm going to make about ACOs in general, um, but also Vermont has a very uh, unique health system landscape. Its ACO is very unique um, and, our, and our regulation is unique. Um, as well, um, we're going to introduce the ACO regulatory framework to you, um, and uh, which includes the statutory charge, the standards of review, so the criteria that you judge the, the budget against, um, and the monitoring and measurement framework um, that we are, are using and that's evolving for evaluating the ACO's budget. So this includes um, a discussion that was started last year around core competencies of high-performing ACOs um, and, and outcomes assessment. Uh, we're also gonna review the process and the timeline, so to sort of orient you in, in, in time and space to this process. Uh, and we will conclude with a board discussion. Um, and so a word, a word about the discussion again, since this is the first uh, a board meeting for several of you. I suspect that board members, uh, especially new members, are going to have questions or comments that are specific to how ACO com concepts are applied in Vermont and how they're working. Um, I definitely think you should ask those questions, um, but I'm not going to assess One Cares or any ACO's budget or specific programs and their arrangements today. I'm going to try to sort of thread the needle between you know, introducing you to this topic and and sort of the charge before you and what is actually going on in Vermont and and the specific ACO budgets because there will be plenty of time um, for that. This is the tip of an iceberg. So questions that are specific to the ACO submission um, should be asked during their budget hearings that are coming up. Um, what I do want to do today is give you the opportunity to ask the kinds of questions that you're interested in, things that you want to know about, um, and this will help the staff to craft our analysis. Uh, I may add some some commentary, um, but specifics of the budget will be discussed at the budget hearing, um, where the entities themselves come before you and present present their budgets um, and and programs. Um, and the staff analysis will be presented following the hearing. Um, to aid in this discussion, um, I certainly do not do this by myself. Um, I have uh, Sarah Kinsler, Michelle Degree, and Russ McCracken, who are ready to participate in the discussion at the end of the slide um, and help with areas where they have particular areas of expertise. Um, we have a, a broad team that crosses um, uh, Green Mountain Care Board teams and areas of regulatory review to help us through this process. Uh, so, uh, I did something a bit challenging in that I opted to give you only one slide um, answering the questions, what is an ACO? There are concepts embedded in here that are entire um, slide decks in themselves, um, and we can, you know, work through those concepts um, um, as we go. But um, here's, my, here's my attempt at one slide to um, explain an accountable care organization to you. So, um, this slide and, and this presentation in general makes the assumption that the audience is already at least somewhat familiar with the concept of an, of an ACO. Um, however, it, it takes time and experience to gain familiarity with how ACOs work. Um, and then there's also the specifics of how the ACOs in Vermont um, work. So in a nutshell, um, what is the problem that ACOs are trying to solve? Um, healthcare, actually, let me, before I go there, um, let me uh, read just read for you the slide so that we're, we're all in the, the same place. Um, so an accountable care organization is, is a group of healthcare providers who come together, um, uh, join together to, to be responsible for the cost and quality of a defined population of patients. Uh, ACOs uh, contract with payers to join value-based payment models that reward good financial and quality outcomes. Uh, value-based payment models are a broad set of performance-based uh, payment strategies 
that link financial incentives to providers' performance on a set of defined measures of quality and or cost or resource use. Like I said, there's a lot of, of concepts there, um, but in general, you have the uh, accountable care organization, which is um, it, a separate entity, um, and they have uh, relationships and interplays with these three major groups, um, patients uh, or the population, um, providers, and, and payers. So in a nutshell, what is the problem that ACOs are trying to solve? Uh, healthcare spending is increasing at an unsustainable rate. We're not getting better outcomes for that uh, spending. Um, what is the solution or the theory of change of, of ACOs? Um, and that is that traditional fee-for-service payments are based on prices, paid for services, and payment is made per service. So incentives are based on volume, not outcomes. There is little incentive to coordinate care. Uh, the ACO model provides a mechanism for a group of providers to join together to care for a population of patients by participating in value-based payments, shifting payment incentives from volume-based fee-for-service to um, outcome or quality base. There are several models and a continuum of what those um, payment strategies are. These include um, pay for performance, shared savings, shared risk, capitation, or per member per month payments, PMPMs, um, fixed perspective, or global payments. Again, all, all topics um, to get into and understand, including you know, what, which of these mechanisms are for which providers and, and what, you know, and how the ACO chooses to use these. Um, but there's a broad, broad set of strategies there. Um, I, I believe that it will be important for us to discuss the theories of change embedded in the ACO concept, as well as the characteristics of high performing ACOs um, and the characteristics of ACOs in Vermont in order to assess the budget submissions. However, today we're starting with the basic concept that ACOs exist they exist in Vermont, and that the state of Vermont has chosen to regulate them through a broad set of financial, administrative, and programmatic re review criteria. The Green Mountain Care Board is charged with carrying out that review, uh, and the scope of that review ranges from ACO programmatic and budgetary line item details all the way up to the sort of ultimate question, are we achieving better outcomes for people and bending the cost curve? So uh, some basics about regulation of ACOs in Vermont. Uh, in 2016, the legislature assigned the authority to regulate ACOs to the Green Mountain Care Board, which is in WAC Act 113, um, and the first budget review was in, was in 2018. The aim of the Green Mountain Care Board's ACO regulation is to provide oversight and transparency into a major component of Vermont's healthcare system and to ensure alignment with the state's healthcare reform goals. The Green Mountain Care Board endeavors to give a balanced view into the ACO as an entity and its impact. Um, and the level of review is based on the size and scope of the ACO. Uh, the Vermont ACO market and regulation is, is unique to Vermont, as I stated, but bears uh, repeating. Um, in conversation with other states and policy experts outside of Vermont, uh, certified ACOs in Vermont are considered highly regulated when compared to other states. Um, and they are subject to a high level of transparency and public scrutiny. Um, it, for ACOs in general, um, so maybe why is this different in Vermont? And ACOs in general, they do not hold insurance risks, so they're not regulated like insurance companies. Um, they are subject to data privacy and data sharing and antitrust regulation. Um, I know of at least one other um, ACO certification program in Massachusetts. So it's been a while since we've done a full sort of um, state state scan on this regulation, but in general, ACOs in other states are not subject to the same level of budgetary and, and programmatic um, review. <clears throat> okay, so one of the more frequently asked questions that we get about ACOs is what is in it um, for the major stakeholders? Why would you do this? Why would you join? How does it affect or impact them? Um, these are the three slides of the or these three slides represent the three sort of uh, sides of that triangle graphic that I showed previously, patients, providers, and payers. Um, so I'll give you the basics um, here. Um, but this is also an ongoing discussion as we work through the review each year because the incentives, accountabilities, and impacts on patients, providers, and payers uh, enabled by the ACO is, is what we're trying to assess here. So um, for patients, um, patients are attributed uh, or assigned or aligned several terms to an ACO based on a methodology that's agreed upon between the ACO, 
and the payer, the insurance provider. Attribution means that an individual is linked to the ACO, generally based on the insurance coverage they have and the care they have received in the past. Um, ACO, some key points here. ACOs must notify patients that they are attributed, um, but it's not something that you necessarily sign up for. Um, attribution does not change your insurance coverage or your plan design. Uh, attribution does not restrict freedom of choice to see any provider. However, insurance network restrictions still apply. So it's all based on what your insurance um, arrangement is. Uh, the patient's or the person's um, uh, sort of agreement uh, um, is with their insurance company still. Um, attribution may, however, provide enhancements, increased access to care coordination, or other programs or values that the ACO provides. So uh, as the definition stated, an ACO is made up of a network of willing providers. Uh, providers may join an ACO in order to participate in the value-based payment arrangements and population health programs that are offered by the ACO. Um, providers could be a hospital, hospital system, independent providers, specialists, community-based, uh, skilled nursing facilities, home health and hospice, uh, designated agencies, federally qualified health centers, ambulatory surgical centers, uh, et cetera. Uh, participation can allow access to ACO negotiated payment arrangements with payers, which can provide more predictable payment streams or pay for care that may not be covered under traditional payment structures, fee for service, um, can also require um, or may require providers to bear risk for cost and quality of care. Uh, participation allows access to ACO resources, which might include data analytics, population health management programs, enhancements, waivers, or other transformation support. Um, and participation can promote collaboration across the continuum of care and community-based services. For payers, uh, payers uh, contract with an ACO in order to bring more providers into a value-based payment arrangement. Uh, it shifts some accountability for cost and quality outcomes to the ACO, and it can um, lessen payers' risk. Um, if successful, this would improve the health of the insurer's covered population and over time reduce overall cost, for example, from um, chronic diseases. Um, so ideally, it would shift uh, some population health activities, care management, and utilization management to the ACO and providers um, to streamline patient experience and lessen insurer, excuse me, and lessen insurer um, administrative burden. So uh, to orient us in history here, how long has this concept been around? So the term ACO uh, goes back to a 2006 meeting of the Medicare Payment Advisory Committee, or MedPAC, um, in 28, uh, sorry, 20, 2008. Um, con the concept was scored favorably by the Congressional Federal, uh, Budget Office at the federal level in 2010. The ACO model was included in the Medicare program through the Affordable Care Act. In 2012, um, the Federal Centers for Medicare and Medicaid Services launched the Medicare Shared Savings Program and the Pioneer ACO Program. Um, and then kind of zipping ahead through the present, ACO implementation continues to grow um, through, bro through both public and private payers and different provider organizations. Um, so goals were set during the first uh, Obama administration to transition Medicare lives into a value-based arrangement. The concept has been supported by both parties and through several uh, administrations since then. Um, so in short, the concept has been mainstream for about uh, 10 years. The ACO or value-based payment models are the current models of payment reform that we're operating within, not just in Vermont, um, but nationally. So here's an ACO, a brief history of ACO oversight um, specific to Vermont. So from 2014 um, through 2017, Vermont had shared savings ACO programs for three payers, um, Medicare's national program and similar programs for Medicaid and Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont uh, with three ACOs. In 2016, Act 113 charged the Green Mountain Care Board with oversight of ACOs. In 2017, the board adopted Rule 5.0, which established standards and processes to certify ACOs and annually review, modify, and approve their budgets. 
In 2018, the Green Mountain Care Board certified one ACO, One Care Vermont, and completed the first budget review of that organization. This was also performance year one of Vermont's all-payer model. Um, in 2021, um, we, uh, after doing this for several years, um, we started working on some program uh, improvements. So one um, is that the board adopted guidance for Medicare only ACOs. Uh, so One Care is the only certified ACO in Vermont, but not the only ACO um, operating. Uh, and we needed to adopt sort of a, a general guidance for, for new entrants um, in this space. Um, as well, to improve our regulatory framework, the Green Mountain Care Board reviewed uh, the core competencies of high-performing ACOs, which led to recommendations to enhance the board's regulatory framework. Um, one note here, in general, places where I put links in these slides, um, I recommend um, for people that are new to this process, this is highly recommended reading um, to give you sort of context. Obviously, the rule and the statute and such um, are required. Um, and some of these other uh, presentations and things give you some background on where we've been um, on, our, on our journey um, of, of ACO regulation so far. Um, in 2022, the Green Mountain Care Board reviewed a uh, Medicare-only ACO operating under Medicare's direct contracting model. That was our first um, sort of new uh, review. That was Clover, Clover Health. And we will review uh, a new entrant Medicare-only ACO in the Shared Savings Program for 2023. Um, that is Gathered Health. As uh, Susan mentioned, uh, Clover Health is no longer operating in Vermont. So uh, sort of where we're at, 22 and beyond, um, we uh, as a team are continuing to work to include the ACO core competencies and ACO performance uh, benchmarking. So our sort of measurement and monitoring approach that we've been evolving, um, we're continuing to work that into the regulatory framework this year. Um, ACO oversight will evolve um, with any future all payer model agreement. Um, there's sort of a, a tie that part, part of our charge here is to align, um, align those things. So as we move from this base of, of sort of the extension agreement to any, any new agreement, um, the oversight will necessarily evolve as well. Um, as well, we're working to sort of in gener generally standardize our guidance, particularly for Medicare-only ACOs, now that we've seen two new entrants um, in this space. Um, and to get even more level of detail, we have um, been working on our transition to using the adaptive financial reporting database for ACL financial reporting. This is the same system used for hospital budgets. This should improve our analysis um, as well. So there have been um, some really good program improvements over the last couple of years. Okay, so moving into sort of an overview of the uh, statutory uh, requirements. So the, um, the Green Mountain Care Board's oversight of accountable care organizations consists of two things. Uh, there's certification and, and budget review. So we try to be clear about um, who is required to go through what process and, and where the kind of lines are, because they can be a little gray. Um, these regulatory processes overall um, sort of in plain language, include a review of programs and investments to facilitate the shift to value-based care, uh, investments in health improvement activities, tools and analytics to support providers and improve health care quality and re reduce unnecessary costs, uh, ACO administrative costs, and alignment of ACO strategies with Vermont's all-payer model goals. So the certification uh, piece of it. Uh, certification occurs one time following the application for certification, um, and then eligibility verification is performed annually. So each year we look and we see, uh, does the ACO continue to meet the requirements of certified ACOs in Vermont? Certification applies only to ACOs seeking Medicaid or commercial contracts. Medicare-only ACOs are not required to be certified. That's partially because they are subject to, um, you know, particular uh, Medicare requirements are sort of outside of our jurisdiction. Uh, certification ensures that ACOs seeking to receive payments from Vermont Medicaid and commercial payers have the systems in place to do the work that's required of an ACO. 
budget review. Uh, in a nutshell, all ACOs operating in Vermont are subject to budget review. There's a threshold of 10,000 lives, uh, that's Vermont lives, that defines the scope of the review. The review of ACO budgets occurs annually, usually in the fall, prior to the start of the budget program year of January 1. Payer contracts and attribution are finalized by spring of the budget year, and the ACO submits a revised budget. So there's a little bit of a bifurcated process um, because at the time of our review, which is prior to the start of the performance year, um, the ACO is still negotiating and finalizing their contracts. So they give us their budget based on their best uh, estimates and assumptions. We review that budget. Um, and then once those contracts are finalized and attribution is finalized, they submit to us a revised budget. And we review it against what, um, you know, what their assumptions were. Um, and then we have sort of the set the set budget that they're operating under for the year. Uh, the board monitors ACO activities and performance throughout the year to ensure compliance with the requirements of budget approval. We refer to these as conditions and to ensure that the ACO is operating as required um, under the all payer model agreement. The ACO standards of review are here. And again, uh, you'll want to check out these links to get the specifics. I'm not going to go through all the, all the criteria today, just sort of point you to where to look. Um, we do walk through the, the criteria um, or work through the criteria with you as part of the review. So the standards and requirements um, are set forth in 18 BSA Chapter 220, uh, Section 9382, uh, also Green Mountain Care Board Rule 5.0 and in the All Pair Model Agreement. Specifically under Rule 5.405, the board considers any benchmarks established under the rule. Uh, the criteria listed in Section 9382, of which I've provided at the end of this presentation, there are about 16 specific or 16 criteria on that we're that we're looking at when we review the budget. And then uh, as well, the elements of the ACO's payer-specific programs. Um, and any applicable requirements under Section 9551 um, or the Vermont All Payer um, Accountable Care Organization Model Agreement between the state of Vermont and CMS. Um, so we're required to look at, you know, to sort of align those um, under this process, as well as the broad statement of any other issues at the discretion of the board. Um, so that's why it's helpful to understand what is important um, to board members when assessing these entities. Uh, and the ACO shall have the burden of justifying its budget to the board. So that's why I'm going to refrain from describing the ACO's specific models today in any way, um, because they will come before you and present their um, budgets and their programs uh, to you. Okay, so here's a, a, a brief overview of the certification process. For uh, ACOs, as I mentioned before, all ACOs that accept payments from Medicaid or commercial insurance must be certified. Um, and uh, once certified, an ACO must annually submit a form to the to the board to verify that they are continuing to meet the certification requirements and describe any material changes to any matters addressed in the certification sections of the rule. Uh, the following are the sections of Rule Five that cover the requirements for certification of an ACO. Um, and the board does not need to vote on the certification um, updates um, unless there is an area where we feel they're not continuing to meet the requirements. Uh, and so then th there are these 10 areas of the rule that we review um, for certification. And we will go through those when we, um, you know, with you as we uh, complete their certification review for this year. Okay, so this is the uh, ACO Oversight Perpetual Calendar year over year. Uh, maybe sort of oddly starts in June, whoops. Um, but I'll start where we are now, which is October to November. So um, they've submitted their uh, budgets. Um, we're in the process of reviewing those submissions. The ACOs will present their budgets at hearing um, later this month and in November. Um, and as well, what happens at the same time is that the ACO and the payers present, um, or, or the payers really, based on their contracts with the ACO, present um, their prior year results. Um, so a tricky thing about this is we have our feet in um, 
uh, sorry, Michelle degree, you said this the other day, three canoes sort of each different, the prior year, the present year and the budget year. Um, so they will present, um, prior year uh, results in November as well, so that you can see those results as we are reviewing the budget year um, uh, submission. Um, that will all be October to November. In December, um, the board publicly deliberates to approve, modify, or deny the budget um, and, and hold a vote. Um, and the program year starts on January 1. Um, in the springtime, um, is when the ACO submits their prior year actuals and their final contracts and attribution for the current, what will be the current program year. Um, so we do have a, a revised budget process that happens in the springtime. And then um, over the summer, um, we, we update the guidance. Um, so the requirements that they will need to submit for their next budget review. Um, and we also work on monitoring uh, measurement and enforcement review of the previous year's budget order. Um, and then they submit certification in September and we start our review all over. Uh, finally, a specific calendar to, uh, to this year and, and where we are right now um, in green there is today. Um, just the first uh, tip of the iceberg introductory presentation for you. Um, on October 24th, Gather Health um, will present their budget to the board um, and you will be able to um, ask their questions and hear about their, um, their model. On November 2nd, we are planning to present a staff analysis um, on Gather. Uh, we tried really hard to fit all of these things in. This is the first time that we're reviewing two ACOs at the same time. Um, so this is a tight, a tight schedule. There's the hearings are set, but potentially some of these dates could move. But we are attempting to work through Gather, which is uh, shorter and has a smaller scope, and then shift to One Care so that you can hopefully keep your review, um, you know, on one ACO at a time um, as much as possible. The One Care budget hearing is scheduled for November 9th. Um, and then later in November, um, we're gonna kind of walk you through the ACO, the, the certification process that applies to One Care only. Um, and if, if ready, um, you could vote on the Gather Health budget in mid-November. Um, on December 7th, the staff will present our analysis on the One Care Vermont budget um, with, you know, Potentially, um, or historically, we've done this vote the week before Christmas, um, the vote on the One Care budget. Um, however, we, we do have until the end of the year. And then again, there's ongoing monitoring um, and uh, uh, throughout, throughout the year. Um, I want to, just about the end of my presentation here, um, I just wanna make a note about um, discussion and then a quick note about some of my resource slides. Um, I, I suspect that board members um, you know, are gonna have a lot of, of questions as I mentioned before. So um, this, this is an opportunity to, um, to ask some of those um, and we will um, either note them for our review or point you to resources or, um, but you know, I'm, I'm interested to hear um, your thoughts so far. A quick note about my resource slides that I'm not gonna go through. Um, this is, um, a uh, kind of a flow chart of how, of the sort of requirements of who's, who's subject to what review um, and what type of guidance documentation we produce. Um, so that might, you know, might be helpful for reference and points you to the statutory citations. Um, we also, as I mentioned, have the 16 criteria here in case you um, just wanna have them handy. And then we try as much as possible to define uh, our acronyms and jargon that we use we don't make this more difficult to understand than it needs to be. Um, so that, that concludes my remarks. I'll turn it back to you, Chair Foster. Thank you, Ms. Melamed. Uh, that was extremely informative and helpful. Um, I recognize that probably took you a lot of time to put together. It had a lot of value for me. Um, and I'm gonna turn it to the board to see if there are any board questions. I have a couple myself, um, but why don't we first go to board member Lunge. Thanks, I'm good. This is my seventh rodeo, so I have no questions. Ms. Holmes, do you have any questions or comments? 
I don't. Lots of rodeo action here too, but thank you. And thank you, Marissa and team for putting that together. I think it was really comprehensive and helpful. So thank you. Mr. Walsh. Uh, thank you, Chair. And uh, Tom's fine. Uh, no honorifics needed. Um, Marissa, thank you. That was very helpful. Um, I appreciate it. Um, I guess maybe this, I'm sure there'll be further discussion, but I'm wondering from this presentation, um, the will there be further discussion of the levers we have available as regulators to uh, to make changes, to enforce changes. For example, if we were to ask uh, an accountable care organization in Vermont to provide us with um, data on the outcomes of the patients that have been attributed to them, um, but then they were not able or did not deliver the outcome information, what recourse does the board then have? Yeah, so we have um, very broad authority to ask for the information that we want to know and um, put conditions or requirements on the ACO. So um, we um, will, um, our review will include a discussion of levers that you have um, and recommendations um, that we have for for those levers um, or how to use those levers um, so, so that certainly will be a part of the um, of the process. What is challenging um, with ACO oversight, now again, this is your first, uh, not yours, but um, some board members' first process. Um, it's, it's different than some of our other regulatory processes in that with um, rate review or hospital budgets, you're actually approving a number, um, a trend, and there's a, or, or a rate, um, and there is a, a, a sort of a a piece of that um, with ACO oversight, which is actually a little bit outside of what I'm talking about today, the, which is the benchmark. I'm not, I'm not going to go down there. But with the ACO budget specifically, there's not a very specific number that you are approving. So identifying those levers um, and um, what the board can affect and how you want to um, help um, um, uh, impact or what you want to regulate on is, is is tricky, is challenging with ACO because there's not a, we, we don't boil it down to a, a specific number. Um, so we will um, certainly talk you through that. Um, in terms of enforcement, that might be a good um, Russ question. Um, we can either uh, save it for later, but he's he's more of the authority on on enforcement than me. Yeah, that's, it's, um... It's fine. It's, I've got a lot to learn. I look forward to learning from you, uh, from you all. So uh, thanks for um, this presentation, and I'll look forward to more in the future. Dr. Merman? Uh, yeah, thanks a lot uh, for the presentation. It was, it was really helpful. Um, there's two areas within ACOs that I've been thinking about that I would like to know more about, and I don't know um, whether or not these are things the, the board would regulate, but I think it's good for us to think about. And one is the, um, the quality metrics that are used within ACOs and how, you know, how those are chosen, how those um, are measured, and how those are impacted by the ACO program. And my 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 bias in that is I I guess I'd like to have quality metrics that really matter to individual patients and families, um, that are that are uh, in, in those metrics. So do you know if you could comment on how the quality metrics are chosen and how those work? Yeah, I'll make a I'll make a quick comment and then I'll that might be enough, or I'll see if if Michelle wants to add because she's our quality expert. My my. Quick comment is that um, is that uh, there are contractual um, quality metrics within the the payer and, and ACO contracts, which they which the uh, payers will report to you on uh, in November. So that's another um, 
I think I mentioned in my timeline, that's another presentation that will happen. I think at the moment scheduled for November 21st, um, where the payers come in and report on their uh, quality uh, metrics for 2021, so the the prior year. Um, so that's kind of the I think maybe the first place that you'll see it in terms of how they're chosen. That is also a really big, um, a really big important and complicated question. I'm not sure if there's like a way that Michelle wants to 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 sum it up, or we can leave it and say it's a really important question, and and we will talk about that um, as we go through this process. I think that's a really nice uh, summation. I think the only thing that I would add is that um, given that different payers serve different populations of Vermonters, their measures are different for reasons that make good sense for the populations that they cover. So for example, in a Medicaid space, you're going to see a lot of you know, children and adolescents and things, whereas you likely won't see those types of measures in um, Marissa, you are now showing all of us again. <laughs> uh, uh, yeah. In, in um, you won't see that so much in the Medicare space. So there are places where they differ, but um, for good reason. And I'll I'll just flag that. And then I think um, Marissa is right to to let the payers really talk to you about how they go through that decision making process, but also recognizing that from the outset of each of those individual payer contracts, a lot of the measures have remained the same um, for reporting and kind of consistency purposes. Marissa, can you stop sharing your screen? <laughs> yeah, I'm not entirely sure how that happened. I'm trying to get it to stop. Um, I, it was showing my presentation and it switched to this, which has never happened to me before. Um, I apologize. That is okay. I think um, I'm hopeful that that's a, a close enough answer for now for you, um, Dr. Merman. And if you have more questions as we sort of work through the process, I'm happy to have those conversations with you. But I think um, it's a really great question to have with the payers when they come in in November or with one care at any of their hearings. <laughs> If I could add a tiny bit to that, and Marissa, I think if you click the, the little X in the box right in the middle uh, that you will not be sharing anymore. Um, historically, Vermont has has worked hard to develop aligned measure sets um, across uh, all across payer programs as much as possible, both to make sure that we're um, aligning the incentives that providers have uh, and that we're minimizing regular, you know, the, the measurement burden wherever we can. Um, so as Michelle pointed out, there are really um, sensible differences that um, recognize kind of the, the payers populations that they're serving. Um, but to, you know, there was a, there, there was a significant stakeholder process in like 2013, 14, 15, 16 to align the measure sets uh, as much as possible that were being used in the commercial uh, and Medicaid shared savings program with the measure set that was being used for the Medicare shared savings program. And then later transitioning to developing payer measure sets uh, that that aligned relatively well with the all payer model measure set, uh, which was uh, developed um, with at least some some stakeholder involvement in forming that. Um, Robin, maybe you went off mute before and want to add to that because Robin was quite involved. I, I think you did a great job. I was my only suggestion was going to be that we it might be helpful to cover some of the history that you just covered. So thanks, Sarah. Happy to. And I actually now I've gone off mute and come back again. Um, I also just want to say that that effort to continue to develop um, and maintain aligned quality measure sets is still ongoing. Um, Michelle Degree participates in a lot of that work that happens kind of across state of Vermont entities and across stakeholder entities um, to develop those aligned measure sets. Um, Vermont Program for Quality and Healthcare VPQHC recent, recently um, ran a stakeholder work group um, that you know worked on kind of the continuation of that. Um, what I what I see is kind of like a forever project um, of continuing to develop and update and refine um, aligned measure sets. Thanks. I I think it's a really interesting area because um, 
what we choose to measure, you know, has so much impact in one, you know, the, the burden of trying to figure out how to measure it and the complexity of of the measurement. But then two, that's what we'll choose to, you know, uh, evaluate and manage and 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 view our progress. So it's, you know, it's kind of one of the big cruxes of value, I guess. Um, one of the other questions that I have, and I don't know if this is really specifically an ACO question, but it's sort of an impact of ACOs, which is, and, and maybe Marissa, you you might be able to speak to this from uh, other ACOs around the country, but how do hospitals, um, what are some experiences of the hospitals and how they look at productivity of providers when they switch to an ACO format for reimbursement? Uh, you know, the sort of the crux of the fee for service model is RVUs, relative value units, which is essentially um, a value that's assigned to uh, an amount of work that's done in the hospital that's a kind of a complicated old system that has a lot of um, issues, but is sort of what we've been using for a long time to evaluate productivity. I'm just curious how, if you know of systems outside of the area or in Vermont where hospitals have moved to a different system to evaluate productivity and thus value within a healthcare system? Yeah, it's a great question. Um, off the top of my head, um, I I don't, um, but I will say that um, the board uh, is in a really unique position um, to, to sort of explore that because you do uh, look at hospital budgets and, and regulate hospitals. Um, you know, when I showed that triangle, uh, you know, you have insight into um, uh, payer rate setting and, and hospital budget. So the way that the dollars sort of flow um, between these uh, entities and what sort of impact they have um, and how, you know, how that money works once it gets to that organization is, you know, you do have some um uh, lend into that through the board's regulatory processes. So um, it's certainly something we'd want, you know, we want to sort of help you explore. And I, um, you know, particularly appreciate your um, perspective sort of operating within that system of being a provider to understand how, how that works when it gets to the providers. In terms of other states, um, I'd have to think about that or, or research a little bit and get back to you. Um, Certainly happy for any um, of my colleagues to to add to that answer as well, if, if they'd like. I can jump in with a, a tiny bit more. Um, I There are definitely examples, although I wouldn't want to name anything specific right now and kind of misspeak. There, there are for sure examples of um, provider systems shifting toward like a, a fixed salary model um, and kind of non-RVU based physician compensation. Um, we can ask uh, we can ask around to get you some examples of um, of of how that looks. The thing that I want to highlight is like taking a step back. Um, our process has uh, our process is looking like I, th I think of this as four tiers. Um, it doesn't work as well to uh, talk with my hands when I'm on screen. So we've got like a couple of different tiers of relationships. We've got, you know, the payer and the ACO. Uh, and this process gives us great visibility into that relationship. We've got the ACO and the provider entities. So like the, the entities that the provider that the ACO is contracting with. So a hospital that decides to be in the ACO's provider network. Where we don't have great visibility is the relationship or through this process, but we have much more visibility as Marissa is saying through the hospital budget process um, is how a hospital or a practice chooses to pay its individual clinicians. And so I think like we, we are as staff are talking about kind of how all of those relationships um, impact the care that individual people receive from our healthcare system. Um, but it takes it it takes a couple steps to get um, to get down to that level, uh, and we we don't necessarily get to see it all in one process. Tom, do you have something to add? Yeah, thanks. Um, I don't. That's a really good question, Dave. And I'm I'm not familiar with any research on um, changes in productivity of the providers within a facility when an ACO is launched. All right. But some terms that come to mind that um, I have seen research on: there are spillover effects that happen when the changes that occur 
in the because of the formation of the ACO spill over into the way that care gets done throughout the organization. Um, so there may be, if we were to search spillover effects from ACOs, we may find some productivity information in there. I'm, I'm just, it's not at the front of my head. Um, and there's also the other term that gets used in consulting land quite a bit is the foregone economic contribution, which when you reduce utilization of attributed ACO members, which is the, the point, you're trying to keep them healthier and reduce utilization, those changes in your organization spill over into the non-ACO organization parts of the organization where you're still being paid fee for service. So you're you're losing an economic contribution there because of the formation of the ACO. So there have been research into those areas, um, but I'm not familiar with anything specific about the productivity of providers. I think it'd be hard to tease out. And my, my question is actually more about the measurement of the productivity as opposed to the productivity in the sense mm -hmm. that like um, productivity measurements are classically in this RVU mm -hmm. approach, which is very, um, it has certain biases as to what it thinks it's higher value or what not it thinks, but what it attributes to being higher value. And if there's a way to measure productivity with a different lens on value. That, that's a hospital level, you know, mm -hmm. thing and not so much a, a care board level thing, potentially. I, I don't know. I mean, Sarah, you know, there's maybe other ways to look at that that Sarah mentioned, but I think that it's just an interesting question that I have that I would, it would be nice yeah. to be able to provide some resources to hospitals if we had insight into it. I agree. Um, yeah, yeah. Dr. Merman, anything, any other questions you had? Great. Um, Marissa, I just had a, a, a couple. I, I see under rule 5.402, the board can establish benchmarks. Um, have Has the board established any benchmarks? Yeah, great. Um, that's a great question. So we use benchmarks in several different ways, um, which sometimes gets a little confusing. Um, I think what we're talking about here is um, that the board can um, establish certain, um, uh, just to use a different, a synonym, targets or benchmarks or something that the, that the ACO has to hit. Um, that's sort of separate um, from the benchmark setting that's done under each payer program in terms of their um, total cost of care benchmarks. So the benchmarks we're talking about in that, in that guidance are, um, yeah, specific uh, other specific sort of budgetary or, or programmatic targets we want to hit. Um, and the answer to that is that um, until this year, um, we, ha we hadn't actually set any. Um, in this year's guidance, uh, the, the 23 guidance for the first time, we did sort of dip our toe into that. This is sort of an attempt. Like I said, there's no particular number you're approving. This is sort of an attempt to be like, can we define benchmarks or numbers? Um, and in this year's guidance, we did put in um, uh, several uh, uh, benchmarks that we wanted them to consider. And they were around um, investment in something called, or what was called the value-based incentive fund, um, which is variable uh, quality payments to providers. Um, the uh, second benchmark was around, um, so I'm going off the top of my head, consistency with the um, board's um, approval of, of rates in the um, in the rate review process, which is kind of a standard uh, condition that we've issued. And the third one is around um, uh, targets for fixed perspective payments, um, which is a complicated issue. We, do, we did not set a particular target, um, but that's been an ongoing discussion. Um, and we required some reporting from the ACO around this um, in, an, in sort of an attempt to set a benchmark. So the answer is that we have sort of dipped our toe in benchmark setting. Um, and we will and we will talk about that as we go through the process. Um, it's been challenging to define um, what those benchmarks should be. Uh, hopefully that helps. It does thank you. Um, the only other question I had was 
relating to the risk cap that the board would approve. Um, is there any guidance or benchmarks that the benchmarks board looks at the board in evaluating whether or not the risk cap is high enough or too high? Um, so good question. So the risk cap and the risk uh, the risk model again is a is this sort of a significant area of review um, in our budget. I'm I think I would have to reserve answering that for now, um, if that's okay. But to say that it is a um, it's a it's a required it's a required part of our review. Do we have set um, sort of guidance on how we do that? Um, I think no. Marissa, but we'll can I jump in and walk you through and, it? I think. Please do. Yeah. <laughs> for a minute. So uh, the the risk cap issue has evolved over time significantly because of COVID. So prior to COVID nineteen. The board used a couple of different ways of analyzing whether the risk was too much or too little. Uh, we required an actuarial certification, for example, where we had um, the ACO, in this case, One Care, uh, hire somebody to perform that and then give us verification that the risk was appropriate for the model. With COVID, uh, quite frankly, a lot of the risk uh, models no longer made sense because of the pandemic and things being so unpredictable. So that hasn't been something that's been highlighted the last couple of years because of COVID. So I think, Marissa, you could pull together some of that historical stuff from the early years. Mm, sure. um, and that might be helpful for folks. Thank you. Thanks, Robin. That's helpful. Yeah. The, the, the COVID factor uh, has been significant over the last couple of years. So sometimes I forget that that has uh, that has sort of impacted our review um, in ways that we you know didn't necessarily set out when we first started doing this <laughs> um, at this time I'd like to open up to public comment unless there are any other board questions or comments and for public comment if you could please use the raise your hand function on teams uh, I'll try and call on you in the order in which your hand uh, is raised I'm not sure I've ever done this before, so bear with me. Mm -hmm. I see uh, Mr. Walter Carpenter has his hand raised. Please go ahead, Mr. Carpenter. Uh, Owen Walter is fine. No need for the mister. Informal is best. I wanted to say to Owen that he's my fourth Green Mountain Care Board mem chair. I've been with the board since its creation and help to create it. I'm on the advisory committee. Anyway, make it short. Uh, thanks to Tom and Dave for their questions. That's what I was thinking through all those presentations. And thanks to Marissa for that overview. Sometimes, even though I've been involved with this for so long, it's still almost impossible to grasp because it is so complex. And that, to me, is one of its vast problems. Um, as a patient and someone who almost died from our private insurance system, I keep wondering why we need this whole ACO thing in there, because it adds another layer of complexity. Um, <clears throat> I mistrust words like accountable and that sort of thing, like affordable, because they generally are words that they cover under. But in any case, <clears throat> as a patient, I also, when we talk about payers, we always say like the insurance companies, public and private, are payers. They're not payers. They're middle people. We are the payers. And I'll leave it at that so others can shoot forth. Walter, thank you for your comment. It's really nice to meet you and thank you for your uh, involvement and in, in your participation throughout the years uh, with the care board. You're my fourth director. <laughs> I'm a survivor, Owen. Given the length of my term, I hope you have many, many more. 
Um, next, I see uh, R.H. Guest with a hand raised. Um, R.H., could you please identify yourself for the record and uh, please go ahead. Hi, right, thank you, Chair Foster, Robert Hoffman. Uh, some questions and comments. Obviously, the board's under no obligation to reply, but if you choose to. Um, Dr. Merman uh, is an employee of UVMHN and uh, as well as uh, UVMHN being the sole owner of the ACBO that is the single partner to the all-payer model agreement. Uh, I would suggest this, that this is a clear conflict of interest. Will Dr. Merman be recusing himself from bu budget deliberations related to this ACO? Again, no obligation to respond, but I put that there for your consideration. Uh, next. Since the 2019 budget round in fall of 2018, in response to public comment, this board has assured the public that its single all-payer ACO partner would provide a summary of investments to date and its return on investment. My understanding this is this was subsequently determined to be an activity that would be pushed out and finally performed at the end of the APM six year run of year zero through five. Will the board be working with its ACO partner to provide the fiscal summary of to date return on investment? Uh, those investments total roughly $250 million in administrative support and programmatic support. Uh, the public would call upon this board to include to this end something conspicuously absent to date, a year over year reporting of utilization rates by hospital and payer for primary care, specialist care, ambulatory care, ER, ED, and inpatient care from year zero through most recently available data. The APM agreement was premised upon an increase of the right care at the right place at the right time. Thus far, there is very little other than the NORC report available demonstrating that specialist rates were in decline, as were annual well visits. Annual well visits. No, no return on investment summary would be complete without this information. In 2011, former Green Mountain Care Board Chair Anya Wallach wrote publicly that the value-based programming being discussed by all of you today, many years later, would allow Vermont to execute on what she called in her publication, a quote, audacious goal of bending the cost curve without limiting access to or quality of care. This board through the annual hospital budget process delivered on its role to cap annual hospital growth. This was most recently confirmed by Dr. Joseph Paris in his hospital budget presentation stating that the board has been singularly effective in bending the cost curve and sees no indication that the ACO takes credit for any of that. The ACO, whom Ms. Wallach now serves as chair for, was meant to deliver on her audacious goal. Instead, hospitals, as we're all aware, have become extremely insolvent under the weight of annual caps on budget growth. Dr. Broomstead, CEO of the largest system controlling two thirds of hospital spending, has recently been on the record saying, the record saying that the consequence of this is unfortunately they will have to limit access to care and won't be able to staff up to optimize the value of care that their wholly owned ACO promised it would deliver on. He ignores that promise wholly when he makes these statements. Research now emerges that not only has Vermont become sicker but that worse still, hundreds of middle-aged individuals have likely died due to delayed care. This board owes it to the public to reassure the public that ACO non-performance as a counterparty to the all-payer model agreement did not play a role in care rationing described by Dr. Brimstead. Finally, perhaps most importantly of all, Melissa Melamed's work with its single APM ACO partner was she merely remiss during the last ACO budget process or deliberately withholding information to satisfy Rule 5.0, Section 5.403, Subsection 6, 
the ACO has an obligation, quote, to report information on actions, investigations, or findings involving the ACO or its agents or employees. This information I, I will suggest is conspicuously absent from its current certification submissions. This board should have been aware since summer of 2020 that the ACO is in fact engaged in a legal action of a very serious nature, allegations which get at the very heart of whether or not the ACO has honored its obligations to this board. The public has be a right to be kept abreast of this action and for the Green Mountain Care Board to address to what extent this action compromises transparency and accountability for the ACO, which the most recent installed chair represented to the public he would be certain to deliver on in accountability and transparency. I would suggest that effective immediately, the board should demand submissions be updated to include information satisfying statute 5.0, section 5.403, section, subsection six. This is absent and the public demands to have access to what information is available regarding extant legal actions facing its singular ACO partner. Thank you. Mr. Hoffman, thank you for your uh, suggestions and your and your comments and your participation. Um, do any board members have any other comments or questions before we move on to the next uh, agenda item? Uh, Ms. Melman, thank you again very much for your time and putting that all together is extremely uh, helpful for all of us. Um, and at this point, I'd like to move it on to the prescription drug technical advisory group discussion, which will be led by Christina McLaughlin our health policy advisor. Uh, and I'll note that Ms. McLaughlin in my transition has taken on uh, multiple hats to help ease my uh, entry here. And I thank her for that and I'll turn it to her. It's been a pleasure. There's been a lot of change and we're all, we're all working together. So happy, happy to help. Uh, uh, Christina McLaughlin, health policy advisor here at the board. And I also staff the prescription drug technical advisory group as part of my work. So I'm just going to share my screen. The presentation is also posted on our website if folks are interested. Sorry, I'm going to move move screens around because I'm running the meeting <laughs> and presenting. Uh, OK, uh, so um, moving to slide uh, two, I just wanted to provide some background as to why we are here uh, today. So first and foremost, the board has the authority to establish advisory groups as needed to carry out its duties. Uh, and as folks may know or remember, um, we have a primary care advisory group to which we've kept after it had sunset in legislation and had kept that uh, using this authority. Uh, and all the way back in May of 2020, uh, the board had discussed in a public meeting forming a prescription drug technical advisory group. Uh, after the House Health Care Committee proposed the idea during the 2020 legislative session. As we all know, it was a busy time in 2020 during that period. We were very much into the COVID-19 pandemic. Uh, so um, the discussion at that May board meeting of 2020 just focused on whether we could um, take on this work with existing resources and staff. And the board felt uh, strongly about uh, uh, supporting this uh, or convening this pr uh, prescription drug technical advisory group. Um, even though the board does not have the authority over the cost of prescription drugs, it is consistently a major cost driver in our health insurance rate review uh, and hospital budget uh, rate increases at the board. So moving to slide three. Um, the board first convened the prescription drug technical advisory group way back when in December of 2020. Uh, currently, the group consists of 12 active members, including representatives from the Attorney General's Office, uh, VAS, uh, UVM Health Network, Blue Cross Blue Shield of Vermont, MVP Healthcare, pharmacists, uh, the Healthcare Advocates Office, other state agencies, plus a GMB st GMCB staffer, which is myself, and a designated board member, which has uh, most recently been board member Lunch. Uh, and then moving on to slide four, uh, the this is a high level overview uh, of the group's work. Uh, as mentioned, the group convened at the end of 2020 and held public meetings in the winter and spring um, after that, and then decided um, in the spring of 2021 
through the spring of 2022 convened two subgroups, one specifically focused on affordability and the other on PBM regulation. And the groups met during that time. Uh, and then in the summer of 2022, uh, those subgroups had adjourned by then. And then fast forward to now in the fall of 2022, uh, the Prescription Drug Technical Advisory Group reconvened in a public meeting to discuss the future of the, of the group's work and ultimately decided they would like to continue working uh, as a group um, and continue, however it may be, uh, with that work. So we'll get into that. Uh, but I just want to um, uh, go over some of the uh, work that came out of that group. Um, this is very high level. There was a lot of work, a lot of folks involved in a lot of meetings. So I no way want to downplay how much work was involved. Uh, but um, on this slide, number five, um, I just wanted to outline the recent uh, the recent legislation that related to the groups and really the subgroup work. Um, so while the PBM subgroup did not have a consensus um, on uh, Act 131, also known as H-353, an act relating to pharmacy benefit management as a group. The bill did address many of the issues related to that subgroup's work. Um, so while that passed, it did not specifically come out of our subgroup, but a lot of folks um, uh, separately had commented on that in the legislature. Um, and then although the two bills um, that did not pass um, were more related to the subgroup's work, specifically the affordability subgroup. Uh, although they did not pass, they were drafted from that work and recommendations. Uh, you'll see the first bill here, uh, S243, uh, did not make it through because the Vermont Department of Health uh, testified they did not need a bill to pursue the feasibility analysis outlined in that bill and assured the legislature its intent to perform the research with or without the legislation. Uh, so that was kind of tacked onto the wall and did not need to be addressed. And then uh, S193 there, an act relating to strategies for reducing prescription drug costs for Vermonters. Again, that came out of the work and recommendations from the affordability subgroup. Uh, and um, there's a link there for folks who would like to read more, but essentially it directed certain ag state agencies to explore strategies for reducing prescription drug costs for Vermonters and directed uh, AHS to coordinate with the Vermont Resource Center to provide info to the public regarding the availability of prescription drug financial assistance programs offered in Vermont. Uh, so again, while these did not make it through, um, a lot of work went into it and perhaps the work moving forward would um, be coming back to, to specifically S-193 uh, and seeing if we can move that through the legislature next session. Um, and I will not go into Act 131. It is quite a big bill. <laughs> if folks are interested, they can reach out, but uh, it is linked there. So with that, uh, all of that information and background, I just want to um, move to the final slide, slide six, uh, to ask the board members here for discussion, really. Um, would the board like to continue the prescription drug advisory group, knowing that the group itself would like to continue the work? Uh, and if yes, which board member will like to staff the advisory group moving forward. There's going to be no votes today. This is mainly a discussion and we may, probably will not actually decide on which board member uh, would like to staff it. As we all know and have <laughs> talked about, we have two very new members uh, and one also pretty new member. Uh, and so I think that today we just wanna discuss this um, and I will bring it back to the group and we can continue this discussion and wrap it up at a future meeting sometime soon. So with that, I will just Stop sharing my screen. And first question I'll go back to is, would we like to continue supporting this group at the board? Thank you, Christina. Um, are there any board members that have any reactions or comments or questions for Christina? Sure, I'll happily jump, jump in, Owen. Jump. Oh, go ahead, Robin. Go ahead. <laughs> oh, I was going to jump in um, since I've been working with the group uh, for the last couple of years. Uh, I think it's been a very dedicated group of volunteers um, who've been coming together to work on the issues. As Christina said, they largely don't, um, the types of, of discussion doesn't interact directly with our regulatory authority. So it has really taken the form of a group that um, uh, kind of comes up with some policy ideas where the affordability group kind of ran into trouble is that 
they needed cost estimates uh, that really are not cost estimates that are within our purview or that that group could do. So we needed to involve other state agencies and that was a, a bit of a challenge. Um, so that's just to give really more color commentary around what the group's been working on and why it's legislatively focused as opposed to Green Mountain Care Board over, you know, regulatory focused. Um, but I think it's it's been a, a good productive group and I would certainly support them uh, continuing if, uh, since they all seem really interested in doing so. Uh, I would, however, love to pass the baton to someone else um, to work with them. And Ms. Holmes? You can call me Jessica Owen. <laughs> um, I, I would just going to echo, you know, more or less what Robin just said. I think that if the group is willing to continue working on these important topics, I think that we should support them. Um, I think, you know, some legislation has come out of their work and I think some future legislation might. And certainly, um, you know, it would be helpful probably at some points to hear from, you know, updates from that group, um, particularly maybe as it relates to prior to hospital budgets when we're hearing about the increasing pharmaceutical drug costs and um, just having their perspective on some of that would be helpful. Uh, in terms of who staffs it, I think, uh, you know, from my perspective, I think we've got, you know, we've, we're a week into uh, two new board members. I think we have to allocate figuring out how we're going to staff lots of different um, projects moving forward. So I, I like the idea of, of waiting to figure out how things all shake out to decide who's doing what. Um, but in, if we're voting on whether to continue the the group, I absolutely support it. Great. Do any other board members have any comments or questions? Uh, hearing none, I'd like to open it up to public comment. And again, please use the raise your hand function. Seeing none, uh, we'll move on. And, and Christina, thank you very much for your presentation and for that background. Next agenda item is old business and new business. Is there any old business to come before the board? Hearing none, is there any new business to come before the board? Is there a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. Second. All in favor, please say aye. 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 Any opposed? Motion carries. The meeting is adjourned. And I'll just note it's one of the most beautiful days in Vermont you will get this year. So I hope that people get a chance to get outdoors and enjoy our gorgeous foliage and the beautiful day. Thank you, everybody. Thank you. Thanks,